Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Alex White. I'm chair of the IIEA's Climate and Energy Working Group, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event, which is the first uh, presentation of the 2022 Environmental Resilience Lecture Series, which is co-organized by the IIEA and the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. And I'd like to recognize and thank the EPA for their sponsorship of this series. And we'll hear from Laura Burke in a couple of minutes. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh, MBE. And I'd like to thank her for being so generous with her time to uh, speak to us today. Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh is director of the ESRC funded UK Centre for Climate Change and Social Transformations, CAST uh, in short. She is an environmental psychologist specializing in perceptions and behavior in relation to climate change, energy, and transport, based in the Department of Psychology at the University of Bath. Professor Whitmarsh regularly advises governmental and other uh, organizations on low carbon behavior change and climate change communications. She was one of the expert leads for Climate Assembly UK and is lead author for the IPCC's Working Group 2 Sixth Assessment uh, Report. Her research projects have included studies of meat consumption, energy efficiency behaviours, waste reduction and carrier bag reuse, perceptions of smart technologies and electric vehicles, low carbon lifestyles and uh, responses to climate change. The title of Professor Whitmarsh's presentation this afternoon is Mobilizing Climate Action, Lessons from COVID-19. She'll speak for approximately 20 minutes or so, after which we'll move to the Q&A session. And you'll be able to join uh, the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom. You should see that there on your screen. Feel free to send your questions in throughout uh, the presentation or when a question occurs to you, rather than waiting until it's over and we tend to have a bunching of questions. So just pop the question into the Q&A uh, once it occurs to you. Please identify yourself and any organization affiliation that you may have uh, when asking a question. And just to bear in mind that the presentation and the Q&A session are all uh, on the record. So feel free also to join the discussion on Twitter. But first, before all of that, I'd like to hand over to Laura Burke Director General of the Environmental Protection Agency to offer some opening remarks today. Laura. Thank you very much, Alex. And uh, delighted to be here this, this afternoon and really delighted that uh, Professor Whitmarsh has, uh, come, is coming virtually, albeit, uh, to speak to us uh, for this Environmental Resilience Lecture. And as Alex said, this is the first of our environmental uh, resilient lectures this year. Um, and the purpose of these lectures is really just to bring all stakeholders together behind a collective message of resilience and emphasizing both individual and societal responsibilities to be good stewards of the environment. Um, and I think the lecture today looks incredibly interesting, incredibly relevant. Uh, when we look at the recent landmark IPCC report on climate mitigation that outlines the nature and extent of the cause of climate change at a global level and of course reinforces the urgent need for action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and that happens to needs to happen now not sometime into the future. And of course, then over the last two years, we've experienced a time of profound change of it due to econ due to the pandemic, but profound change to both economic and then social activity. And whereas this has shown a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and in 2020 there was a 3.6% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, this was really due to the pandemic. Um, and it was due to the fact that we couldn't travel and meet and do all of those normal things. And uh, there is, of course, a significant risk of rebound uh, once the pandemic is over. So really what we're talking about is that the next decade needs to be one of major developments and advances in the implementation of climate action. In Ireland, we've got ambitious targets under the European Climate Law, but also our own National Climate Act from 2021. So an ambition to have a 51% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and that is a really significant challenge, uh, 
but something we need to do. Um, and of course, to do that, there needs to be a significant and immediate increase in the scale and pace of action. So um, the last thing I would like to say before, before Professor Whitmarsh comes in is just to, to highlight work the EPA did with Yale University, and we're continuing to do it, which is climate change in the Irish mind. This was a survey uh, engaging 4,000 uh, citizens from across Ireland to discuss climate change. And what this really demonstrated is that Irish people overwhelmingly recognize the threat of climate change, feel personally affected, and want to see real change. There's a very high level of awareness of climate amongst the Irish population. People are informed and understand the implications of a, climate, a changing climate. And they also see the opportunities that exist for jobs, innovation, and well-being. Um, and I suppose very importantly for Professor Whitmarsh, they also really trust the science and trust scientists, which is a, a good position to be in. So this project will help people to under, or help us to understand how Irish people perceive environmental challenge. And this can fundamentally ch change then how we communicate on the topic. But it also demonstrates that as a country, we're ready for the transition to climate neutrality, that we see the benefits, and we also are, I suppose, well advanced on the journey. Um, so ultimately, effective public engagement is essential because there is going to be significant changes for all of us in the coming years. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Whitmarsh. It looks like a fascinating lecture. It's so relevant. And we, we've all talked about this connection between how we reacted to COVID and how we react to climate. So really looking forward to, to her experience and expertise uh, in, in discussing this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Laura, and thank you, Alex, and uh, and Luke as well for inviting me. It's a real honour to be with you today. Um, and yeah, I, I want to sort of spend the next half an hour or so just reflecting, I think, on the, the, the differences and the similarities between these two global risks and to um, make a few suggestions really from uh, our work and, and wider work on how we can mobilise the public around climate change. So um, if we cast our minds back two and a bit years ago to the beginning of 2020, and it almost feels like another world now, but we were seeing images like this one on the top, top left of the Australian bushfires kind of covering our, our TV screens and, and elsewhere on the media, which really illustrated in a, in a very kind of visceral way, actually, how devastating climate related impacts can be to people and to biodiversity. Um, as the year went on, we saw devastating floods around Europe and elsewhere of, this, of the sort never seen in many of these locations before, uh, leading to loss of life and, and damage to property and, and so on. And um, as we moved into 2021, the climate change evidence uh, grew stronger uh, than ever, and we had the publication of the uh, latest IPCC assessment, um, the sixth assessment report, uh, really emphasizing that um, uh, you know we need to act now on climate change that that we cannot delay and the window of opportunity to act is is closing but but we still have a, a little bit of time left to, to actually take action um, but of course during this time the pandemic hit and so we saw images like this of uh, people in hospital and um, really our lives were turned upside down in many ways um, and these two risks have a number of things in common. They're, of course, global risks. We have been and are being affected by both of them very profoundly around the world. Um, they both need individuals, you and I, to act for the common good. Uh, we all need to play our part. We can't just leave it up to a minority of people. Everybody needs to, to act. And linked to that, we need governments to actually enable and motivate people to change their behaviour. I think both of these risks have also challenged societal resilience. They've, they've really, I think, for many of us, called into question a lot of things that we took for granted about our lives, that actually we could continue the way we were and that nothing would disrupt, would disrupt the status quo. But actually, we know that a lot of things that we took for granted really uh, are not as maybe secure or resilient as we thought they were. Um, and the, the two issues also have some common causes and solutions. 
Uh, travel being maybe the most obvious one, obviously, the fact that we are a, a globalized world, we travel uh, internationally has obviously contributed to the spread of the virus. But um, as Laura has just mentioned, the fact that we were able to stop traveling uh, actually led to, a con uh, led to a reduction in our emissions uh, that cause climate change. So um, global travel has also been a contributor to, to global warming. Um, and I think what I really want to focus on in the rest of the talk is the fact that actually both of these issues do mean that we need to change uh, our behavior very profoundly. They involve people doing things differently to what they've done before. So during the pandemic, this was clear. We were told to stay at home. We were told to wash our hands, to distance ourselves from other people, to wear face masks. And when the vaccine came along, we were told to uh, get vaccinated. So these were things that we all had to sign up to do. And most people did, actually, most people complied. Um, and so there was a really profound uh, change in what people were doing. Um, but the same is also the case for climate change. Actually, the evidence is really clear now that technology alone cannot save us from climate change. We need people to change as well. So in the UK, the Committee on Climate Change, for example, estimate that almost 60 percent of the measures needed to reach net zero will involve consumer behavior change. So things like adopting electric vehicles and heat pumps, uh, eating less meat and dairy, being less wasteful. But the rest of that, the, the wedge there, which they really call technological change, will imply change in terms of the behaviors that professionals and employers and, and policymakers, uh, the, the things that they do, because technologies don't just happen by themselves, they don't get rolled out or used by themselves, they need people to, to implement them, to choose to buy them, to adopt them, uh, and to use them. So actually, you could argue that all of the measures needed to reach net zero will involve behavior change, even as uh, e either as private citizens or in our professional uh, and workplace capacity. And the level of change really is profound. There's a, a fairly recent report from the Hotel Cool Institute that did some modeling, uh, looked at various European countries and showed that most of the European countries need to uh, cut their carbon footprint by an enormous amount. In the UK, for example, we need to cut our carbon footprint from eight and a half tons of CO2 per person at the moment to two and a half tons in just eight years time, if we're to stay within a 1.5 degree uh, warming limit. So really profound change over a very small time frame. And this message actually is starting to uh, get out into the, the media, interestingly, even into the more right of center uh, newspapers, we, we're seeing messages that are coming from the, the scientific evidence that we will all need to change and that, that there are things that we can all do to um, contribute to climate change. Um, and as I've already mentioned, and as Laura's mentioned, uh, one of the lessons of COVID, one, one of the few sort of happy consequences, if you like, of the pandemic has been that we have seen a drop in emissions over the last couple of years. So in 2021 alone, we had a 7% drop in global uh, CO2 emissions, mostly due to travel restrictions, uh, people traveling less. And so that might suggest to us, well, maybe for climate change, we just do something similar to what we did for COVID. Clearly, there were so many negative consequences of the pandemic and of the restrictions in terms of, um, you know, the impact on jobs, uh, as well as kind of well-being and broader social consequences that we should be able to do things differently and in a more planned way for climate change. We have not very much time, but we have a little bit more time to be able to respond to climate change in a more, have, have a more planned societal tran transformation. But what we do know is that change can happen very radically and, and almost overnight if we want it to. But the differences are also really important to consider between climate change and COVID. And some of these are quite obvious, really, because COVID, of course, for many people, is a much more tangible and, and perhaps more emotive risk if you sort of just think about the fact that all of our lives really were touched by COVID. I mean, you only had to look out the window or just pick up the phone to realize just how profoundly people were being affected, um, uh, that that kind of really brought it home for people. Whereas climate change for many 
tends to still be, while it is maybe important for many, it, it isn't necessarily as, as kind of as visceral, as real, as tangible. Um, it's still seen as rather a, a sort of distant risk. Similarly, um, COVID, uh, there, there were things that you and I could do to actually reduce the risk of contracting uh, the virus. We could wash our hands and distance and all those other things. Whereas with climate change, it's, it's more difficult to actually protect yourself. There are things you can do, but because of the nature of the risk, uh, it's much more sort of diffuse and global that actually uh, any action I take to mitigate the risk will not necessarily benefit me directly. So it's a, people don't feel that they have the same ability or efficacy, self-efficacy to actually reduce the risk. You could say there's a lower social norm to act on climate change with COVID, we could see other people wearing masks and staying at home. And so clearly there was a strong signal that everybody else is doing their bit and you need to follow the rules too. There aren't really those clear social signals that we see from, from climate change yet. Um, people are still consuming and they're still going about their lives, which are often quite high carbon lives. And so the signal is not there yet that low carbon uh, lifestyles are the norm. And one thing I'm going to emphasize as well is that there are, 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 for many people, they would say there are fewer government signals to act uh, on climate than there were on COVID. There wasn't, there weren't uh, nightly briefings from uh, leaders. There were not scientists taking to the TV um, so much. There were, you know, the, 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 the visible signals from, uh, from leaders, in, um, both in terms of communications, but also regulatory signals and other things are just not there yet with, with climate change. And um, the solutions are more ambiguous with, uh, with climate for climate change. So sadly, there is not yet a three word kind of motto, hands, space, space, uh, that we can tell the public, do this. And that's, that's pretty much the main thing you need to do. That, that is, we have to change everything for climate change pretty much. So it's, it's a more complex set of messages to get out. Um, and I think as well, there isn't, and I'll show evidence that there isn't um, as much public support for political action on climate change. While that, that the support is growing, it isn't at the level of, um, the public feeling that they would be able to make the same level of change that they would for COVID. And linked to that, this is because we're talking about it being a long-term or even permanent set of changes or transformations to society to tackle climate change. With COVID, we could bear some short-term disruption and pain because we knew at some point we the restrictions would be lifted. So it was a price we were willing to pay, but climate change, it's, it's, it's a longer-term issue. So let me kind of go, dig into a few of these. I mean, if you if you think about uh, the, this kind of idea of psychological distance, so we, we use this term to really talk uh, mean that for for many, climate change is not um, really as real or as tangible as many other sorts of risks. So it, it kind of is something which seems physically distant. Often people associate it with polar regions. Um, the polar bear is often the poster child of climate change. Whereas compare that with images for um, COVID, and this is people like you and I, this is images of hospitals, this is, this is everything around us, this is very real. Um, uh, similarly, uh, the sorts of ways we measure climate change um, are in terms of CO2 emissions, which is a very abstract kind of concept, something which not many of us would kind of be able to relate to readily. The way in which we measure COVID uh, is often in terms of the numbers of cases or even the numbers of deaths, things that are, well, not just familiar, but they're extremely kind of visceral um, uh, and emotive ways of measuring uh, the, the risk. And as I've already touched on, the norms are, are just completely different in, e in both of these cases. We look out the window, we see people complying for COVID. We see people shopping when it comes to, to climate change. So, so the, the, the two issues really are kind of psychologically very different for people. But another thing that our evidence shows is that um, the government signals are, are very different and those signals in turn affect how people see the two risks. So what we found was that actually, when we asked people about how serious they thought COVID was as a risk, what it, it turned out that they actually inferred the severity 
of the virus from the fact that the government imposed a lockdown. In other words, they thought, well, it must be bad if the government's taking such drastic measures that we've never seen before in living history. It, it, it can only be the worst risk that you know we've ever seen. So they judged, they judged the severity of the risk based on the government's response to it. Now, we also know from our other work that we've done that the public do not think that the gov that, that governments are in general taking enough action on climate change. They don't think that, uh, that, that the risk is being taken as seriously as it seems like scientists say they should. So they're kind of sort of inferring, well, maybe it isn't as serious as scientists are saying. So they are likely to be inferring the fact that uh, climate change isn't as serious as other sorts of risks. So I think this has quite important um, implications for sort of the role of government and how we communicate the issue. I mean, in fact, we can go as far as to say that the government in many countries, I apologies, I use many UK examples, but um, uh, are giving some pretty mixed signals. And, you know, so there is airport expansion. We have had the uh, reduction of domestic flight taxes in the same year that we were hosting uh, the UN climate talks. So the, the, the public is left with the, with the uh, maybe the message, well, I guess there isn't a climate crisis then. Interestingly, we can also look at how climate change and climate policy is framed by uh, governments. And um, in the UK, uh, there was a very interesting forward from the Prime Minister to our net zero strategy, the net zero strategy, which is uh, aims to get us to uh, net zero emissions by 2050, um, in which he talks about the fact that previously going green meant having to sacrifice things, but this strategy means we don't have to wear hair shirts, uh, that in 2050 we'll still be driving cars, flying planes, heating our homes, but the cars will be electric, they'll be gliding around our cities silently, our planes will be zero emission, allowing us to fly guilt-free, etc. Um, so a really quite explicit rejection of the fact that people will have to change their lifestyles, people can continue consuming and living their lives as they have been. Technology will save us. So he's he's a very sort of committed, explicit techno optimist. Um, and so really what is embedded in that strategy is very little of people have to change or there is a need for sort of public engagement. There are hints of it here and there around green choices, but the vast majority of the focus is around technological change. Interestingly, uh, this may be why we see some of these results. So this is from some work that uh, colleagues in our centre have been doing to explicitly compare how people see the risks and responsibilities of COVID and climate change. So what we see uh, is that, um, so the, the figure on the left here shows the perceived responsibility for tackling these risks, okay? And you've got the per personal responsibility and government responsibility. So whereas um, most people see government being, government and uh, individuals, oh, sorry, um, for the two risks, okay? So the, the sort of pinkish blobs are COVID and, and the triangles are, are um, climate change. You see that for both of the risks, the government is seen as being as having a high level of responsibility. But there is a gap here when it comes to personal responsibility, whereby COVID was seen as being as individuals as being responsible, as responsible as governments for tackling COVID. But um, when it comes to climate change, people place much more responsibility with government than they do with themselves. Um, Similarly, uh, they also feel that their actions are less effective to tackle climate change than COVID. And the same study found that people are less willing to act, uh, sorry, to accept restrictions to personal freedoms for climate change than for COVID. In other words, we could say there isn't the, there isn't the buy-in or the social contract really uh, for tackling climate change to the same degree as there was for COVID. The public are not yet there to say, well, we accept that you know, we need to radically change. And what we know is that we really do need to engage people and build this social mandate, this kind of, um, this support for radical change. We know that one of the strongest predictors of policy support is how fair people think that uh, policies are. And part of that sense of fairness, it's not just about distributional, in other words, sort of whether some people are kind of worse off 
uh, than others, but it is also about procedural fairness, actually uh, bringing people with you, engaging with people, having dialogue in order to actually um, bring um, the public into decision making about climate change. We know that that sort of more participatory policy making tends to lead to better as well as fairer outcomes. Um, and it can help build the political mandate for action. So it can give, it can embolden policymakers to feel they have the support of the public behind them. And this is why we see actually there's quite an important role for more deliberative forms of um, engagement um, like climate assemblies. So as was mentioned uh, earlier, um, I was involved in the UK Climate Assembly. This is a citizens assembly on climate change, which brought together over 100 members of the public to uh, discuss how we reach net zero and came out with some really bold recommendations for uh, change. Um, but of course, um, in Ireland, uh, the, the, the same um, happened several years earlier. So the citizens assembly in Ireland also uh, made some really bold recommendations um, for how Ireland can reach um, its climate targets. This sort of way of more substantively uh, engaging the public can actually be really powerful in terms of making progress towards that sort of transformational change we need. Um, okay, I mean, I've mentioned as well that we had some really clear messaging from uh, most governments around what we need to do on COVID, but maybe we don't really have the same for climate change. In fact, we know there are gaps in, in people's knowledge about what to do on climate, that's clear. We also have an evidence base on how better to communicate climate change. And one of the things that comes out of that is that it's about knowing your audience and what they care about. Because actually, and marketers have known this for a long time, is actually you, you can use different messages to appeal to different market segments. So for the green consumers, you can talk about the green benefits of whatever product you're trying to market. For other people, maybe you talk about what are the personal benefits. So it'll make you feel good in the case of this, this water. Um, uh, and similarly for kind of measures that have been put in place in workplaces where they've talked about more sort of tangible benefits to the individual, like it'll save you money or um, you'll have more time. Those sorts of things tend to have broader appeal uh, than just talking about it'll reduce emissions. And the good news is that actually most of the measures to tackle climate change do have wider so-called co-benefits, so additional added benefits for individuals and society. Um, the, the latest IPCC assessment includes, includes a slightly terrifying table that you see here, don't worry, you don't need to understand that, but essentially what this table shows uh, is where there's the most blue colours, it's where there are the highest positive impacts from um, measures to mitigate climate change um, um, across a, a number of different dimensions. Um, and essentially what this table as a whole showed was that the vast majority of measures to mitigate climate change has led to or, or could lead to improvements in well-being. Um, and health was one of the areas where they showed really robust and very strong effects, but more generally across um, other areas, uh, including kind of social cohesion and participation in education and um, so on, there were, there were also benefits too. So this is something that we can use in messaging around climate change to engage to a much um, broader audience, I think, and actually bring people with us to say, this is not just about climate change, which maybe seems like a distant threat to many people, but actually this is about the here and now and improving your quality of life right now. In fact, our analysis shows that those with greener lifestyles in general happen, um, tend to have higher well-being, and this is something we've shown across a range of different cultures around the world. In other words, going green is not about sacrifice, contrary to what our Prime Minister um, has spelled out, Far from it, it actually improves quality of life. So we can communicate this, I think, to quite powerful effects. I've also mentioned that the social norms uh, were very different for COVID than they are for climate change, that at the moment, uh, the norms are rather um, uh, unhelpful when it comes to getting people to act in lower carbon ways. But we know that we can kind of harness and change social norms through a number of ways. So some of the kind of classic um, 
uh, nudge type studies um, have used social norm messaging to uh, quite substantive effects. So just telling people that most other people in, well, in this case, the hotel are reusing their towels or most other people in your workplace are starting to uh, give up their car can be very effective um, because people like to conform to the norm. They think, oh, wait, this is this is the done thing. This is the norm. This is what other people like me are doing. Um, so even just describing what other people are doing can be effective. We know that even on a more implicit level, actually, people look around them and see what other people are doing and they infer things that could be appropriate for them. So we know that uh, adopting solar panels, uh, if people in your neighborhood have solar panels, uh, the chances are greater that you too would be likely to adopt solar panels. So we see this these kind of neighborhood effects that having uh, people around you adopt uh, um, solar panels or also electric vehicles, um, the more likely you are to as well, because you see people like you starting to um, change their behavior. And we know the same is, is true for other sorts of behaviors and cultural norms can be very powerful. Communication by itself uh, is not enough. I think I really want to emphasize that. And we, of course, we can, we saw this in the pandemic. We had very clear messaging, but we had other things too. We had rules and we had, um, we had uh, availability of tests and vaccines and, um, and other things that reinforced and enabled people to uh, change their behavior. So a recent, um, a recent study actually in meta-analysis compared different ways of changing people's um, climate behavior. And they found that what we sometimes call downstream interventions, but basically information provision of different kinds, whether that be labels, uh, or giving people feedback and other sorts of uh, ways of giving people information is only about two to three percent effective in changing behavior. The more upstream you go, the more you actually change the context in which people act, um, either that through nudging, uh, one sort of set of techniques where you're sort of changing the choice architecture, um, the more effective that tends to be. And so to give you just two concrete examples, there's a really nice study um, by Garnett and colleagues where they doubled the proportion of vegetarian options available in a number of canteens. Um, previously it had been one in four of the options, then it went up to two in four. So you could still choose meat, there were two meat options available, but just that increase in the availability of veggie options increased plant-based sales by up to 80%. Um, Using defaults uh, can be also extremely effective and a nice study uh, done in Switzerland showed that when they put energy consumers onto a renewable tariff by default and they could still opt out if they wanted to and actually doing that would have saved them a little bit of money because the fossil fuel tariff was cheaper. Um, the vast majority stuck with that renewable default. So previously, it had been 3% opting to choose in, opting to choose the renewable tariff when it was the default, uh, almost 90% stuck with that. So an enormous effect by just making it easier, making it the default to um, do the right thing. And of course, you can change the physical environment as well. You can reallocate road space away from cars to uh, lower carbon modes, for example, and actually some of that was done during COVID to enable the space for people to, to, to move around without being uh, too close to one another. And some local authorities have uh, managed to retain some of those measures because of the obvious health and environmental benefits of doing that. Um, but one of the really key headline things that comes out of all of the work on behavior change is that the more you can combine measures, uh, the more likely you are to have additive effects. So yes, have a bit of information, but also definitely have maybe some economic incentives, some regulations, some uh, other things going on as well, because that is more likely to uh, altogether to, to be much more effective, to remove the barriers to behavior change. The final thing I want to kind of focus on is just to talk about timing because we know that actually it matters when you intervene, because habits are one of the biggest barriers to behavior change. Uh, often we do things kind of on autopilot and we maybe just don't think about how we're going to travel to the shops or to work. We always just go by the same mode, for example. But there are times when our habits are disrupted. Maybe we are moving house or um, retiring. 
um, those big life changes can uh, disrupt our habits. And so at that point, we're more open to changing our, our behavior in, in a number of ways. And we, we call these times moments of change. Um, and there is some really nice experimental evidence showing that actually, if you intervene during these moments of change, you're more likely to effectively change people's behavior. So in this study, uh, this was a German study from a number of years ago, they gave um, uh, residents uh, a, some information about their bus service uh, and also a one day pass to try the bus for free. And they gave this, that same intervention to people who had recently moved house in the last few weeks, the relocating group, and to people that had not recently moved house. And they found that amongst the relocators, bus use increased by over double as a result of that very low cost behavior change intervention. Whereas the same intervention amongst people that had not recently moved was not significantly uh, effective in changing bus use. In other words, it matters when you intervene. You're more likely to be effective if you can get people when they're more open to changing their behavior during these sorts of moments of change or disruption. Um, and there's evidence from a number of different areas, actually, that sort of global cr crises of various kinds can actually really help trigger or, or accelerate innovation. Uh, we've seen this from the history of um, inventions and the, the, the bicycle was um, invented as a result of the eruption of a volcano, which led to uh, essentially the, the death of a lot of horses. So people had to find a new way of getting around. The bicycle was invented out of necessity, essentially. And of course, we've seen in the pandemic enormous amounts of innovation, uh, not just the speeding up of um, developing vaccines, but also in terms of communication technologies have um, improved vastly over the last uh, couple of years. There is converging evidence that timing matters, that actually uh, during periods of disruption, uh, people innovate and uh, potentially do things differently for the long term after that. Which really led us to the, the question of, well, does that mean that COVID might represent a moment of change where we can reconfigure people's habits to be more sustainable? So we've been tracking people over the last two years. We're just about to launch the fourth wave um, of a series of surveys that we've been doing in the UK. Um, and uh, we've been looking at how people's um, behaviours have changed uh, over that period and to see to what extent people might be becoming more or less sustainable. At the height of lockdown, so this was a couple of months into uh, the restrictions in the UK, we saw, as you probably won't be surprised, that a lot of people were shopping online. Uh, their grocery shopping was, was more likely to be done online. They were also reducing their food waste. Um, and they were uh, generally shopping less. They, they were uh, well, shopping in different ways, but overall reduced consumption. And of course, a lot of people working from home. Interestingly, people were also changing their leisure activities. So what we found was that compared to before COVID, at the height of the uh, lockdown restrictions um, in about the middle of 2020, uh, more people were saying they were gardening um, and spending time doing kind of creative hobbies. This is essentially out of um, necessity, given that we were sort of trapped in our homes um, and had to find things to do. Um, now, as it happens, most of those things are lower carbon activities than, say, some of the alternatives that people might have been doing, like shopping for fun. Um, but when we ask people as well, well, of the things that you've had to do differently because of the restrictions, are there any that you actually want to continue to do in the longer term? the vast majority of people said, yes, I have actually enjoyed some of these things and I want to keep doing them. So people saying, yeah, I've discovered online grocery shopping. That's really great. I'm gonna keep doing that. Um, I enjoy spending time in the garden. I've, I've enjoyed kind of having a daily walk, um, uh, visiting, visiting garden centers, recycling and so on. And so on the right, you see all the sort of the categories of the sorts of things that people were most likely to say and, people discovering new sort of hobbies and things that they particularly enjoy and wanted to stick with um, was fairly, uh, was at the top, but environment as a category was actually relatively near the top as well. Of course, as the restrictions lifted, consumption has uh, increased, travel has increased, food waste has increased, 
Some things are sticking though. Um, some people are continuing to work from home or at least partly work from home. Uh, and we found that people have generally enjoyed being able to work from home at least some of the week. Um, we also see that walking levels are now higher than they were before COVID and car ownership is down, which is very interesting. So there are some things which, uh, despite not necessarily needing to do these things, some people are continuing to do some of these things, which have a lower carbon footprint. And in fact, um, we haven't seen a reduction in concern about climate change during this time. In fact, it's uh, it's actually gone up. We've seen a growth in the sense of urgency about climate change over the last couple of years, um, contrary to what we expected. But a lot of polls actually are showing that um, we're now at record levels of concern about climate change, despite having had a lot of other things to worry about uh, over the last couple of years. Um, and we know that there is support, growing support for policies to reach net zero, even as high or even higher in some cases, uh, as there was support for COVID restrictions. So despite the fact that I, I mentioned earlier, we still need to build the, the public mandate for, for some of the measures to reach uh, net zero, we, we already have a, a strong support for things like buying energy efficient appliances, uh, cutting down car use, flying and so on. So I think there has been um, some opportunities actually that present themselves uh, from COVID. We have changed our behaviours in a number of ways, travelling and consuming less, uh, spending our leisure time in generally lower carbon ways. And many people want to continue with some of those things. They need to be locked in though with the appropriate infrastructure incentives and so on. And those things are generally not in place yet. But uh, most of the public would actually support a lot of those measures. So I'll wrap up here just to reiterate, we can learn a lot from the COVID crisis. Um, we can see that very radical behavior change is possible under certain circumstances. We're not there yet in terms of the social mandate for radical change, for climate change. We need to build that. We need to engage with people. We need to communicate some of those wider co-benefits I mentioned, the fact that actually well-being is likely to be higher uh, when we take climate action. And I think that will help build some of this support. We need to implement a range of different measures to enable people to change their behavior as well. Um, the downstream, the communication is important, but, uh, but even more important is the sort of upstream stuff, the changing the environment in which we act. And get the timing right, we can actually use periods of disruption to try to get people to innovate, try new things and, and encourage them to stick with them. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it to there and welcome any questions you may have. Thank you so much um, for that presentation. And I think what you did very effectively was you identified, look, what are the great insights that we can draw from this awful period of, of COVID-19 and, and use them effectively in the period ahead as we, you know, try to um, try to accelerate the work that needs to be done on, in the climate agenda. But you've also then identified, look, there are there are drawbacks. Let's not get, let's not get carried away. There are there are big differences. The challenges are, are different in very significant ways. And the one that I suppose that I was very interested in what you said about people thinking that, look, the, it must be serious if if the government is introducing restrictions. That's kind of very, there's sort of a number of layers in that, if you think about it, because people are kind of thinking, well, not so much immediately about the restriction or how, or whether it's good or bad or right or wrong, but if the government is doing it, they, they must be doing it for a reason. And in a sense, that's kind of a positive view of the state and a positive view of government. There's a certain element of trust in there, um, just to look on the bright, the positive side, that if people think, well, if, if the government is doing that, they must have a good reason for doing it. Um, and you know, the Ram Emanuel terrible old cliche now not to waste a good crisis and so on. I'm, I'm just, I'm wondering, before we talk about all of the, you know, I suppose many of the things you spoke about, which are the downstream incentives, the nudging, you know, the timing issue, all of the, you know, redesigning public, all of the stuff that we, the good stuff that we're all trying to push for and, and hope to see happen. Is there though still, I'm going to start at the extreme end of the conversation, is there still a role though for, this idea of, look, we should fear climate change. I mean, there should be an element of fear here. It's not immediate. It's not manifesting itself in the immediate sense. We might, those of us who live in this part of the world at this time of, of our lives probably won't see it. 
but it, we should fear it for our for our for our children and for those who, who come after and that therefore there is a case for leveraging fear um in the way that perhaps governments did or had to do during covid I think that's a really good question because I think that has tend to be the way that maybe some campaign groups in the past have, have often tried to motivate people to take environmental action, but we know it, it only works in very specific circumstances and those circumstances are if people know very clearly what they can do to reduce the risks. So you can, for example, with smoking is a great example. So you can tell people, yeah, this is going to kill you. And you can give them really graphic pictures on the on the cigarette packets of what's going to happen to your lungs if you keep doing this and absolutely terrify them. Uh, but at the same time, you have to be very clear of what people can do to, to avoid the risk, which is, of course, give up smoking and give them ways of uh, of, of doing that so support services and you know put in place regulations and, and um, incentives and things to also in, enable and, and incentivize people to change so all of that kind of sense of efficacy like I know what to do and I can do it has to be there if fear-based messaging is to be effective and at the moment we just it's so difficult to take a lot of those steps for most people and maybe in some cases they don't actually know really clearly what to do people don't actually have a good sense of what makes a difference that we just it it wouldn't be very effective to really scare people into taking action on climate change so i think we can definitely spell out the risks i think it's important to do that but what we need to be much better at doing is giving people a sense of and here's what you can do to 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 avoid those risks and showing, as you effectively did towards the end, showing people that our lives, the quality of our lives can improve intrinsically, you know, for its own, in its own right, even, you know, apart from the necessary agenda that we're looking at in terms of the, long, the, the longer term impact of, 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 of climate change. Um, you know, we've had a debate here about turf burning in recent weeks, and I think one of the most effective uh, uh, um, elements of the public discourse was the discussion about uh, air quality. So, you know, immediate air quality in urban, well, rural Ireland, in, in the country generally, um, and, and associating that risk to health with the burning of turf, which also then has a broader context for it in, in relation to the climate agenda. People, the, the idea of buying in, and uh, you again, you drew that out very well, that there isn't the same buy-in um, Inevitably, there isn't the same buy-in to the necessity to take action in relation to climate as there was manifestly in the case of the COVID um, emergency. And then you, you, you drew from that the, the, the lesson that it's important that people can see that they should be able to participate in decisions, participate in building uh, uh, alternatives themselves to have a stake, I suppose, in how these decisions are made. And you mentioned citizens' assemblies, and we've had a number of them here, as you know. And in fact, we have a new one now on biodiversity, which just sat for the first time, I think, just this weekend, gone, or at least very recently. Um, how important do you think, because we're now coming to the stage of, of budgeting, of carbon budgeting. I know we've, you've had it in the law in the UK for a while. We have it here now, and we're now starting to work out precisely how that's going to affect different sectors. So each sector will have its budget and the public debate will have to be at least partly about if one, if one, if, if, if one sector doesn't meet its budget, that will impact another sector. So therefore, everybody should be at the table to see, well, look, if they're going to argue for a reduction on the ask for them, who's going to take the impact? Would that be another area of importance for this deliberative approach that you've spoken about the people are all at the table I think yes I mean I think that's a really good uh, good way of looking at it as well as across the sort of different sectors is that you might think and I suppose there's been a tendency for the public to think well you know I've, I've done a bit of recycling and then you know so that's okay then for me to maybe just take a flight and uh, that, that people maybe make those sort of implicit calculations that well I've, I've done a bit of good so I can sort of afford to be a bit a bit bad here mm -hmm. Well, the idea of net zero is that actually we've kind of everything's got to be pretty much zero. And yes, we can have a bit of kind of, um, you know, sort of negative emissions or taking carbon out of the atmosphere for those really difficult to mitigate sectors. But actually, we've all got to pretty much radically get as close to zero as we as we possibly can. So I think having those sorts of deliberative 
um, fora can actually help show that, yeah, there's nowhere that you can kind of borrow from. It's all got to pretty radically reduce. Yeah. Um, Donald Brolicon, who's an IIEA member, um, asked the interesting question, do you have whether you have suggestions for changes that we could make to institutions? And I think, I mean, obviously he means existing institutions. Um, this is slightly as a contrast to the to the citizens assembly model to existing institutions in order to get government action at the local, national, transnational level to act for the common good, given the influence of interest groups and so on. And while you're just thinking, I mean, I think that's the interesting question. When you put up the slide of uh, Rishi Sunak, and it, the, 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 and I think this is not doesn't just apply to the UK, it applies here, it applies elsewhere, that in some ways, all of the institutions of government need quickly to be transformed. I mean, the Chancellor of the Exchequer should be the Chancellor of, 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 the climate, of climate change. You know, the Minister for Finance should be the Minister for how do we tackle and resolve these big questions. So, uh, you know, our existing institutions, government institutions are about managing a, 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 a kind, an economy that's no longer fit for purpose. So, what sort of institutional changes occur to you? Or, or do you agree that they're necessary? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is a huge question. And I mean, I'm not, I should say, I'm not a political scientist. Um, there are going to be people, people that are better qualified to answer that, this than me. But I am involved in, um, at the moment, the, the UK House of Lords has an inquiry on behaviour change to reach environmental and climate goals. And we're looking at kind of the fact that really there's a huge... Uh, deficit in the kind of current governance arrangements that would enable well not just effective net zero policy but 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 behavior change as part of that um and so there is huge fragmentation across the sort of the, the government departments and so while you might have sort of formal responsibility for tackling climate change residing in well the business and uh, the business department as it is uh, here um of course, all of the departments have to be, you know, radically sort of changing what they do as well. And so they're there, but, but they aren't, they aren't to different extents. And so that kind of the fragmentation across the different and the sort of siloed working continues to be a problem. Um, I don't know if there are really great examples of where governments have cracked this to, to kind of get that more effective coordination across different departments, because we definitely see and the public perceive it, you know, that airports are expanding, but you're saying climate change is an emergency and you're, you know, so, so it's, it's quite clear that we're not very joined up in our country. But I, I have to say, I don't know of any particularly great examples of where uh, there is better coordination, but maybe maybe having the budgets as you talk about, maybe that helps a little bit to move towards something where there's a bit more uh, joined up thinking. And perhaps also, certainly it occurs to, to me in the Irish context, maybe it's similar to the British, uh, you re refer to Boris Johnson and his speech and so on, or some of his contributions that really these actions need to be coordinated in the prime minister's office or in the Taoiseach's office as we have it here. So that government departments inevitably are, BC, you know, they. they the Department of Agriculture is always going to be influenced by the by, by the farming sector. It's just yeah. the reality. Of course, they bring about change and they say they would stand up to them at different times and they don't always get what they want as well. But inevitably, the, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the Irish Farmers Association most often uh, go in and see the, the Minister for Agriculture. That's just the way the, the way life is. And the yeah. same in other sectors. So if the if the prime minister's office or the Taoiseach's office isn't involved in that coordinating and that you know really driving insisting on change I, I think it's probably going to be slower yeah and I think I guess the other thing because also we see some better models at devolved level in the UK so the Welsh government for example have the, mm. the well-being of future generations act which actually mm. enshrines the well-being of future generations within everything that the government is supposed yep. to be doing uh, and they have these sort of ways of working that are supposed to mean that they're all much more joined up now it doesn't always work quite as well in practice but at least it's a model where it's a gov governance sort of arrangement which is trying to address that need for much like having sustainability at the core of everything that happens no question the welsh experience i think it's really worth worth looking at um Jean Moore of the uh, National Economic and Social Council, um, and by the way, she, she and her organization have been very much to the fore um, when it was neither profitable nor popular in, in looking at these, as they say, looking at these behavioral issues uh, for a number of years. And she says a really interesting presentation. She thanks you for that. The urge to travel or to fly, uh, in particular post-COVID, 
for many is a strong motivation to counter what I suppose people feel are a, a few years of being deprived of the, the uh, opportunity or the right to travel. That sense of regained freedom. I mean, we've all felt it, if we're, if we're honest. And, uh, but how, how do you counter that with low carbon options, given the high carbon cost, um, if most people are going to be flying more frequently? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And it, and it is so difficult, isn't it? Because, um, yeah, we all want to be kind of enjoying travel again. But I suppose at the moment, the, the incentives are so perverse that it, it enable people to, to travel f- uh, by plane for really short distances. Mm. Whereas, you know, they, we should be uh, encouraging people to take the train in lower carbon modes. Like uh, What's happening in Germany, I think, at the moment is quite interesting because they're about they're debating I think giving, uh, making all travel around the entire country by by bus and train only costing eight or nine euros or something, like really making it wow. incredibly cheap to take public transport. Um, and where it, so if you had that sort of like shift, whereas you know in the UK we carved a, a, like the tax on domestic flying. I mean the, the UK is small; we don't need to be flying in the UK. But so if we had like yeah, if the cost if the cost uh, was much cheaper to travel lower carbon modes, uh, then I think you know we would see people at least starting to shift away. And we've had discussion around f- frequent flyer levy as well, and actually that's quite popular. The public are pretty much um, behind. Is one of the most popular net zero policies um, that we've found in our research is the the idea that you kind of ramp up the tax that the duty that is uh, that, that passengers would pay the more flights they take per year. So maybe if you take one flight, there's like hardly any tax. If you take sort of three, four, five, like it starts to become incredibly uh, expensive. Um, and so it means that, yeah, maybe you could take a flight every couple of years or something, and that would be that would be okay. But that it, you'd just start to think about whether you really want to take a lot of flights. Um, so I think there are lots of things we can do to, yes, maybe take the occasional flight or ideally travel by other modes, but just maybe not to the degree that people are just enabled and encouraged to do at the moment. Sure. Don't want to be promoting any newspaper, but Henry Manson, the Financial Times this weekend, had a great feature on uh, rail travel in Europe. Um, and he, he, he has announced that he's not flying anymore. He's not going to take flights at all, ever. And he has a, I don't know if he said at all, ever, but he's given up flying. And, but he has a terrific, uh, very informative piece on rail travel in Europe. And of course, the length of time it takes to get from from one from from one destination to another is a, a key factor for people. And unfortunately, one of the things that came out of the piece that he wrote was the cost. You know, it's it cost five hundred quid or something for him to get from London to I think it was Budapest um, round trip. And I don't have the piece in front of me, but I mean, he said that Ryanair was like I don't know forty three euro or so, forty three pounds. Yeah. So that, that's the I suppose a, a measure of the of the challenge. Um, a, a, Anna Davies is professor of geography in Trinity College, and she says leadership from government is clearly significant to support climate action. But what role do you see the private sector playing in changing behaviour towards a low carbon future? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's an important point. I think. I mean, I, I I like to see the kind of like the three key elements of a transition being government absolutely has to lead, but they can't do it without the public and businesses. And businesses are important because they create the products and services uh, that we consume as consumers, and so uh, they will. And they but they will only innovate and, and invest in greener products and, and services if government support them and provide really clear policy signals that this is the direction of change and we can see that that's working quite well in terms of electric vehicles in the UK and and some other countries because the government has said by 2030 we are banning the sale of uh, petrol and diesel cars so manufacturers know right that's the that's the rules of the game that's that's where we're heading for and so they invest heavily in, in electric vehicles and everyone's kind of moving in that direction but we don't see the same thing happening in other areas like retrofit insulation or kind of energy and, and other sectors where there's just mm. there's no clear sense of what the government is uh, kind of expecting or whether there would be any support for businesses that move in that direction so that so businesses are absolutely critical to the transition but they need in turn to have, kind of have some support and motivation from government i think you said somewhere somewhere else that the real lesson from covid19 um is, is not so much that you can just adopt things and you can just read it across and say, look, great, that worked, that worked, that worked, let's just do it for climate change. But you you, you said, if I'm, I hope I'm not misquoting you, but you said that, look, the real lesson is a bit more subtle. 
that politicians and governments should realize that they actually have more room to maneuver with the public than they think they have. Uh, that in other words, that they, there, there is a greater openness uh, and willingness to change um, amongst the public than perhaps politicians give people the credit for. And that's because politicians, and I, I, I know myself because I was one, they, they tend more often to be pulled back by, by people and sectors and so on that want to slow things down or perhaps stop things in their own interests than, than they are ever really motivated by those who are, who are pushing forward and pressing forward for change all the time. So, but you, you, you said, I, I think you did say that, that look, the real essence is that politicians perhaps just be a bit more, give, give the public a bit more credit for what they're, what they're willing to do. I think that's absolutely the case. Yeah, I think what we see is that actually the public is ahead of governments in, in many countries when it comes to climate change. They want more action. They're frustrated that the government isn't doing more. Uh, and, and yes, we need to kind of make sure that it's done in a fair way, in a way that manages costs. Cost is a concern to the public, particularly at the moment. So yes, it's not that there's carte blanche to do any, anything, but the public really do want the government to do more and they will change if they're given the right support, the right sort of degree of leadership and so on. So I think, yeah, have some confidence that far from avoiding behaviour change, as is the current approach, people are very happy to play their part. Yeah. Okay, um, we're just on two o'clock and we always promise people that we, we finish at the time we, we say we finish and I'm sure you've other things to do as, as our viewers and participants uh, have to. Thank you so much for a fascinating um, and, and really interesting um, uh, uh, analysis of this point because you know we, there's a kind of a presumption abroad that like you just would just take on board the lessons or sometimes that, that awful word learnings which I hate. I don't think learning is now, but anyway, but take on board these these and then just move forward. It isn't as simple as that. I think you've demonstrated it isn't as straightforward as that. But there is a huge amount uh, that we can benefit from uh, and understand in relation to behavior and the willingness to change uh, from observing and from just recalling what's happened over the last couple of years. So thank you so much uh, for, for that analysis, for being so clear and for, um, for fielding uh, a number of our questions. We've all found it extremely interesting. So thanks so much, uh, Lorraine, for your time. And thank you all for your attendance this afternoon and for your participation as always. And we look forward to seeing you again soon.